Now, today we are going to discuss infective endocarditis, one of the very dangerous condition and uh, with a very high mortality rate in spite of so much advances in micro, uh, in uh, so much advances in uh, antibiotics, right. Still, many people die with this condition. And so how do we define an infective endocarditis? Infective endocarditis is a condition in which patient's endocardium is colonized by microbiological agents, patient's endocardium is colonized by microbiological agents, right and microbes are actively multiplying within the endocardium, is that right and damaging the endocardium. Now, infective endocarditis, uh, while we are discussing infective endocarditis, let us talk about some other type of endocarditis as well that there are at least five type of endocarditis you are supposed to know. Of course, one is infective endocarditis. Then another type of endocarditis is rheumatic endocarditis. It develops during rheumatic fever. Rheumatic endocarditis. Now look, how the infective endocarditis and rheumatic endocarditis are different that in rheumatic endocarditis, this is a streptococcal infection initially in the throat which triggers an immune response which cross react against the patient's connective tissue including the connective tissue of the valves of the patient, right. So what we can say in rheumatic endocarditis, there is I mean, immune mediated attack on the endocardium. But in case of infective endocarditis, there is uh, you can say bacteria or microbe directly present within the myocardium and multiplying and damaging the. So, we can say this is microbiological inflammation and this is immune mediated inflammation. Then there is one more type of endocarditis which is related with the carcinoid syndrome, it is related with the carcinoid syndrome. In carcinoid syndrome, 5 hydroxy tryptamine which is also called serotonin, right. 5 hydroxy tryptamine and serotonin is produced in massive amount and its metabolites uh, injures the endocardium and especially right side of the heart, uh, endocardial you can thickening starts. So, we will discuss this in detail later. Then there is another endocarditis which is related with hypercoagulable state that when person's blood is hypercoagulable, it has a high tendency to coagulate. Uh, in such patient, uh, sometimes on the valvular surface, the formation of thrombi, right. And we call that condition marantic endocarditis, marantic endocarditis, marantic endocarditis, right. Then there is one more type of endocarditis. Will you tell me? There is one more type of endocarditis that is SLE related endocarditis that is systemic leopus erythematosus that is SLE related, related endocarditis which is also called SLE related endocarditis is also called Lipman sac, Lipman sac endocarditis. Now listen, we will discuss all of these, right now we will concentrate on the infective endocarditis, right, we will discuss into detail the causes of infective endocarditis, complications related with infective endocarditis of this, right. And by the end of the lecture, then I will help you to understand that how you can differentiate infective endocarditis from rheumatic endocarditis, what is carcinoid endocarditis, how to differentiate it from others. Uh, how to differentiate the vegetations of Lipman sac endocarditis from rheumatic endocarditis, right. We will discuss all these things, they how they are different from each other and why they have different clinical pathological significance. Now, let us go into detail of infective endocarditis. Now, infective endocarditis can have two factors, two types of basically infective endocarditis are said to be present over there according to the tempo of the disease, according to the clinical presentation and tempo of the disease, infective endocarditis is primarily divided into 
two types of endocarditis. One is called acute infective endocarditis and other is called, yes please, subacute, subacute infective endocarditis, right. Now the art of understanding is you must be able to differentiate these two cases, but you should remember that this clinical presentation is different, that clinical presentation is different, right, and they are both conditions are managed in slightly different way. Acute infective endocarditis is usually produced by the organism which are very, very virulent, right. The organisms which produce acute infective endocarditis, they are highly virulent organisms, highly virulent organisms, right. For example, for example, we can talk about Staphylococcus aureus, Staph aureus, right, highly virulent organisms, very, very pathogenic organisms. Opposed to that, subacute infection infective endocarditis is usually produced organism with low virulence, right? Organism with, organism with low virulence, right? The organism which produce less toxic substances, organism which, which are less destructive, but acute infective endocarditis is produced by the organism which are highly aggressive organisms and highly destructive organisms. Now, when we talk about subacute infective endocarditis, the, one of the most common cause of this type of uh, infective endocarditis is streptococcus viridans, strep viridans, which is released from the oral cavity. Strep viridans, which are normally living in the oral cavity and whenever you are doing some dental procedure from the oral cavity, these bacteria jump into blood and they produce transient bacteremia. They produce transient bacteremia. Again, you have to remember that bacteremia is a condition which is different than septicemia. Bacteremia is just mere presence of bacteria in your circulation and usually bacteremia is transient. For example, you are brushing your teeth, you injure some uh, microcirculation, some bacteria go into your blood. But these bacteria will be very rapidly destroyed by your defenses present in circulation. So, few bacteria from your mouth entered into circulation for a short duration, right? And the, those were eliminated by your body defenses. This type of transient presence of bacteria in your circulatory system is called bacteremia. Please don't confuse bacteremia with septicemia. Septicemia is a condition when bacteria enter into your blood and they defeat your defenses and bacteria are multiplying actively in your blood, is that right? So, septicemia is something less common, but bacteremia occurs even in healthy people very commonly, right? Uh, during, you can say dental procedures, bacteremia occur, sometimes from, from mucosal cracks in GIT, bacteremia occurs, for sometimes small injury on the hand, right? And you get bacteri bacteremia there. So, bacteremia is something common, bacteremia is something common. But again, we have to remember one thing that bacteremia is usually not dangerous. Why? Because in bacteremia most of the time organisms which are going into our blood, they are from commensals in our body and usually they have low pathogenicity, number one. Number two, in bacteremia, uh, our blood system is really aggressive and it dominates over the virulence of the organism which, because organism has low virulence and usually uh, you can say circulatory defenses and uh, clear the bacteria. Number three, you must remember that when everyone passes through bacteremia often, but our endothelium of the blood vessels, endothelium of our circulatory system is relatively resistant to the thrombus formation and relatively resistant to the colonization by microbes. It's worth repeating that endothelium of our circulatory system including the endocardium of the heart is relatively resistant to the thrombus formation, is that right? And all the endothelium including the endocardium of the heart is also relatively resistant to the colonization by the microbes, is that right? 
But what really happens that when bacteremia occurs again and again and a person with a normal heart, he may not suffer with big problem. But if someone has heart which is predisposed to disease, predisposed to infective endocarditis, then even the organism with the low virulence can produce a disease. And now here we are going to another concept. Let me elaborate it. Look, usually acute infective endocarditis occurs on healthy myocardium or endocardium, right? It is usually in the healthy heart. We can say that acute infect, infective endocarditis is usually on the healthy heart, right? And healthy endocardium. But opposite to that, the subacute infective endocarditis usually occurs, subacute infective endocarditis usually occurs to the people who are having some predisposing condition in the heart. They have the people who have some pathological condition in the heart. So they are having some predisposing, predisposing pathological condition in heart, pathological condition. Why? Because in subacute infective endocarditis, the organisms are usually of low virulence. And low virulence organism cannot attack a healthy heart, right? So low virulence organism will usually attack the heart which is already predisposed for the infective endocarditis. I will explain why, right? But in organism of acute infective endocarditis are highly virulent, so they can involve and damage even the healthy heart. Now, what are the predisposing conditions? Right. Actually, all those conditions which produce abnormal blood flow and abnormal jet lanes in the heart. Let me tell you one very simple condition to explain. Let's suppose that a person has a very small ventricular septal defect. Person has a very small ventricular septal defect. Now, what really happens? You know that left ventricle is thicker and high pressure chamber and right ventricle is thin and it is low pressure chamber. Now what really happens? That blood from the left side will be moving towards the right. Now the this is high velocity jet from the left side will shunt to the right side and it will produce injury here. Right? It will damage the endocardium here. And we say that this jet effect will produce injury on the endocardium. And once endocardium is injured, right, once endocardium is injured, it loses its anticoagulant activity and it becomes procoagulant. It can stick the platelets more effectively, right. So what really happens, let me explain that let's suppose this was the jet effect of the lien and endocardium which was present over here, it is injured. Now when this endocardium is injured here, what will happen that to the injured endocardium, platelets will start sticking. When platelets will start sticking, on the platelets coagulation process will start and some fibrin will be deposited. And on this fibrin, more platelets will stick. More platelets will stick and more fibrin will be deposited. So what really happens? that when there is abnormal flow in the heart, whenever there is abnormal blood flow in the heart, there are jet lions produced here, right? And whenever there are jet lions, right, high velocity jet of blood damage the, impinge on certain part of the endocardium and injure that part of the endocardium. When they injured that part of the endocardium, that endocardium is no more healthy endocardium. So it becomes injured endocardium and injured endocardium love to bind the platelets and those platelets will be activated and they will active, uh, bind more platelets as well as they will activate the coagulation process which will convert fibrinogen into fibrin. In the end, this area, you see, where there were jet layer, it will form a small micro, micro thrombi, small micro thrombi. So microthrombi are formed in multiple areas of the heart when the heart has abnormal blood flow. Now these microthrombi are a very welcoming place for bacteria. 
Now you imagine, if some person has abnormal blood flow in the heart, the abnormal jets, there is too much injury to some part of the endocardium and when that endocardium is injured, that become more pro-coagulant and through microthrombi start forming there, microthrombi help the bacteria to settle because as I told you, everyone develops bacteremia, but in a normal person, when bacteria are passing through the heart, they are eliminated or within the circulation, they are eliminated. And even if bacteria reach to the heart in a normal person, bacteria with low virulence, the, those bacteria cannot bind to endocardium. But when endocardium is having such microthrombi, bacteria will stick on them. What will happen? Bacteria will stick on them. And then bacteria will go into deeper area. And when bacteria will go into deeper area, they will start multiplying and make micro colonies. Bacteria will make micro colonies. In these deeper layers, bacteria are well protected from the complement system. Bacteria are well protected from the antibodies. Bacteria are well protected from the inflammatory action. So you can say that these microthrombi act as a hiding place for the bacteria, they act as a settling place, they let the low virulence organism to settle into heart and multiply. But if heart is absolutely healthy, such bacteria cannot settle into heart and they cannot produce infection in the endocardium. This is one thing. Second thing is that when there is, let me make it more elaborate diagram to explain it. So let's suppose this is your heart and this is ventricular septal defect, right? Now jet lions are injuring this area, right? This already we have learned that endocardium is injured, right? With injured endocardium, this is healthy endocardium. This was injured endocardium. I told you platelets will stick and on that, uh, what will form? fibrin will form. Then I told you this microthrombi will act as a binding site for the microbes, right? Even microbe with low virulence can bind with these thrombi, microthrombi. Then these microbes will go inside this and there they will start multiplying and make micro colonies. So we can say that whenever heart has such jet lions, heart will develop the microthrombi, heart will become more predisposed to the infective endocarditis even by the low virulence organisms. Am I clear? This is one situation. Number two situation which I, I want to highlight is that when high velocity jets are moving like this, on the flanks of the high, uh, you can say velocity jets, what really happens, low pressure pools form and blood starts circulating like this, low pressure whirlpools form on the side of this. Let me explain. When uh, in, a, in any tunnel, if one layer of the water is moving fast, then other layers which are slow moving, they make whirlpools. In the same way, when high velocity jets are impinging, right, they are injuring not only this area, rather on the side, they are making the low pressure sink. In low pressure sink, blood keep on revolving like this. And this blood which is revolving here, if it has some bacteria due to bacteremia, then those bacteria will have a pro prolonged chance to remain in contact with the local endothelium and even then bacteria will settle here and start damaging on this area. So what did we learn? We learned two facts. Number one, that jet lions can produce uh, wherever they impinge, they make more chances for bacteria to settle there. Secondly, when there are jet lions, on the flanks of that, the low pressure sinks and they wear blood keep on whirlpooling and bacteria, if they are present in this blood, they have more chance that repeatedly they will come in touch with endocardium and eventually they get a chance to settle there. Is that right? Third thing is that not only abnormal blood flow like jet lions or like uh, you can say whirlpooling and low pressure sinks, even these, this modern era, when we are doing lot of catheterizations to the human heart, even sometimes if there is indwelling catheter or some catheter tip induced injury is there, again injured endothel endothelium or endocardium will become more predisposed to harbor the low virulent organisms. Is that right? Now, once we have learned this thing, what are the conditions which predispose the heart to the infective endocarditis? What are the conditions? Okay, these conditions may be valvular diseases, valvular 
this is the conditions, right? Because when you have some abnormal valvular condition, of course, blood flow through the heart will become abnormal. And when blood flow through the heart is abnormal, then there are more chances that infective endocarditis will occur, right? Again, it's worth repeating. Whenever there's abnormal blood flow in the heart, heart is predisposed to develop infective endocarditis even by the low virulent organisms. Why it is so much worth repeating? Because in such patient, to prevent the infective endocarditis, even you do dental surgery or you do cystoscopy or you are doing, you can say, low GAT procedures or you are doing any procedure to such patient which has, which is going to produce bacteremia, we have to give prophylactic antibiotic to protect the heart. Now, what are these conditions? Of course, at the top must be rheumatic heart disease. Chronic rheumatic heart disease may damage the valve. You must be knowing that chronic rheumatic heart disease produces mitral valve lesions. It produces also aortic valve lesions. And less commonly, uh, rheumatic heart disease can produce lesions on the tricuspid side, right? So, in rheumatic heart disease patients, when there are abnormal valvular stenosis or there is suppose mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation, these patients have a high chance to develop infective endocarditis and whenever we do, you can say any procedure which will increase the risk of bacteremia, we must cover them with additional antibiotic so that there should not be, there should be prophylactic management of infective endocarditis. Then mitral valve prolapse, you know mitral valve prolapse is very common condition. They say up to 5% uh, of the population has prolapsing mitral valve, right? And especially, you know, when mitral valve prolapse at the peak of systole, uh, when prolapsing uh, leaflet slip, that produces mid-systolic click. And sometimes mid-systolic click is followed by late systolic murmur, right? In these patients who have mid-systolic click followed by late systolic murmur, uh, what, what is happening? That there is abnormal blood flow. You are understanding why? Let me explain. That let's suppose here is mitral valve, there is mitral valve prolapse. So what really happens that this valve is prolapsing upward at the peak of ventricular systole and some blood will regurgitate. Now when it prolapses upward, that produces mid systolic click during the top of the ventricular systole, uh, prolapsing leaflet will just move a little, produce a click and sometimes click is followed by murmur due to little regurgitation and especially when click is followed by the murmur, right, uh, then you must give prophylaxis for the infective endocarditis because this heart is predisposed to infective endocarditis subacute type even by the low virulence organism because the normal flow is making jet lesions as well as low pressure sinks on the side. Am I clear? Then we can talk about aortic valve. You know this bicuspid aortic valve is a congenital condition, bicuspid aortic valve problem, right? Even if it is not calcified, you this is uh, this allows abnormal blood flow because normally aortic valve is tricuspid. But if someone has bicuspid aortic valve, right, the uh, left ventricular outflow is abnormal and that uh, increases the risk for infective endocarditis. Then we can talk about, okay, even calcific aortic valve, calcific aortic valve, right, that is a predisposing condition, right. Then any type of uh, valvular stenotic or regurgitating lien even on the right side. But you know valvular lien are more common in the left side and less common in the right side. Uh, then even congenital heart diseases like ventricular septal defect, right, like fellows tetralogy, right, patent ductus arteriosus, right. So in all these conditions, there are abnormal blood flow pan patterns within the heart. And whenever there is abnormal blood flow pattern within the heart, heart is more predisposed to the infective endocarditis, right? Heart is more predisposed to infective endocarditis. One more condition which is important is prosthetic valve. These days in this modern era, we are putting artificial valves in the people who have severe valvular diseases and prosthetic valves are also very much uh, predisposed to the infective endocarditis, especially the organism which commonly involve prosthetic valve is Staphylococcus epidermidis. Staphylococcus epidermidis. Prosthetic valve. Prosthetic valves, 
right? And if they are attacked, the organism is staph epidermidis. Now here we have mentioned some organism. So if someone asks you what is the most common organism which produces, if someone asks you what is the most common organism which produces infective endocarditis, the most common organism presently is Streptococcus viridans. It is found in almost 50 percent of the patient with infective endocarditis, is that right? But in case of acute infective endocarditis, the most common organism is Staphylococcus aureus, is that right number one. Number two, if someone asks you what is the most common organism uh, which is producing uh, infective endocarditis related with prosthetic valve in the long run, that is Staphylococcus epidermidis. And if someone asks you what is the most common organism uh, which is coming from urogenital system, that is enterococci, they are enterococci. Then another rare but extremely important condition is when someone develops infective endocarditis by streptococcus bovis. When someone develops infective endocarditis by streptococcus bovis, right? And what do you think? Why it is so important to know, right? If someone have infective endocarditis by streptococcus bovis, right? What could be the reason for that? Yes. You are going to tell me. Actually, this case is extremely important. You know why? We should immediately look for malignancy in GIT because they have found that the patient who have uh, colon carcinoma, colon carcinoma, or people who have ulcerative colitis, right? They have a high tendency to develop infective endocarditis by Streptococcus bovis. So there is an association between the GIT lesions like. GAT malignancies or ulcerative colitis from the colon or colonic carcinoma that such patient if they develop infective endocarditis to the high risk the organism will be streptococcus bovis. But here while we are talking about the organism it is important to discuss that almost virtually almost every type of microorganism has been have been recovered from the vegetations or lesions of the infective endocarditis right. It can be viral, it may be bacterial or organism may be fungal, right? Every type of organism has been removed. Rather here I should mention that fungal infective endocarditis is very bad and usually if someone develops fungal infective endocarditis, which may be due to candida or which may be due to uh, you can say aspergillus, right? If someone develops really fungal infective endocarditis, uh, they say you have to manage the patient surgically because fungi are well protected in very large vegetations in the center of the vegetation. The so fungi make very large vegetations and within those large vegetations the fungi which are present in deeper parts they cannot be eliminated easily by antifungal drugs. So we have to do the surgery, is that right? So there can be fungal infective endocarditis, there can be bacterial endocar infective endocarditis and in bacteria I told you most common organism presently is Streptococcus viridans, right? Uh, but in case of uh, you can say acute infective endocarditis most common is Staphylococcus aureus, is that right? But when we talk about you can say someone with prosthetic valve, right? In the long run if prosthetic valve develops infective endocarditis most probable organism is Staph epidermidis. But if someone got uh, recently he got uh, heart surgery and he has prosthetic valve and within one to two months he develop infective endocarditis. It may be due to Staphylococcus aureus or it may be due to coagulase negative Staphylococci, is that right? But late phase again when someone has prosthetic valve, the microbe which involve the valve earlier are different and microbe which involve the prosthetic valve later are different. The microbe which involve the prosthetic valve earlier and produce infective endocarditis are usually the organism which were actually planted during the surgery, right? These are Staphylococcus aureus or these may be coagulase negative Staphylococci. But if someone develop after he has a prosthetic valve from, for 5 years and now he develop infective endocarditis, of course the organism was not planted at the time of surgery. Then we think of Staphylococcus epidermidis. Is it clear, right? Then you think of Staphylococcus epidermidis. Again let me check your knowledge. 
But if I ask you that there is a patient who come with ulcerative colitis as well as infective endocarditis or a patient who has colonic carcinoma as well as he develop infective endocarditis subacute, what do you think? Which organism is most probable? Staphylococcus, a streptococcus, not staphylococcus, streptococcus bovis, streptococcus bovis. Is that right? Is there any question? Then while I am talking about all these conditions which, which predispose the heart to the infective endocarditis, there are some host factor which also predispose the heart. There are some host factor which also predispose the heart. But before we go for the host factor, another interesting point is that regurgitant lions are more vulnerable to the infective endocarditis than the stenotic lions. Mitral stenosis patient has less chance to develop infective endocarditis, but mitral regurgitation patient has more chance to develop infective endocarditis. Now, the host factor which you can say increase the probability of infective endocarditis. The host factor may be playing a role in acute infective endocarditis as well as host factor can play a role in subacute infective endocarditis. Now, what are the host factor? Naturally, the factors in which host is having, the patient is having or host is having weak defenses against the micro. For example, if a patient who is suffering from neutropenia, right, if a patient who is suffering from neutropenia or a patient who has immunodeficiency syndrome may be suffering with AIDS or a patient who has some malignancy because patient who have malignancy they are immunodeficient. Then patient who have therapeutic immunosuppression. What are the conditions in which a person may be under therapeutic immunosuppression? For example, someone who has autoimmune disease and you are giving therapeutically steroids or immunosuppressive drugs or someone is having cancer and you are giving anti-cancer drugs which are also immunosuppressive or someone has liver transplant and to prevent the immune mediated rejection of that transplanted tissue, you may be giving immunosuppression. So, all those patients who are, high, who are therapeutically immunosuppressed like patient of autoimmune diseases, like patient having the transplanted tissue, like patient who have anti-cancer chemotherapy, right? All these patients are more vulnerable to all infections including infective endocarditis, right? Then patient with diabetes mellitus. You know, in diabetes mellitus, immune defenses are weak and bacteria are very happy in such sugary environment. Is that right? So, as you know, diabetic patient develop overall in the body uh, infections more frequently and more severely. And infections are more difficult to manage in diabetic patient. Of course, infective endocarditis is also more common in them. Then patient who are alcoholic. You know, patient who are chronically alcoholic, they are nutrition, they develop multiple nutritional deficiencies. They are not taking vitamins properly because they are taking caloric need from alcohol, right? So, chr chronic alcoholics which are not uh, taking balanced diet, their immune def system become weak and they become more vulnerable to infection. And of course, when we are talking in all these things, we should never forget your friends. You know your friends? The friends who are IV drug abusers. You don't know, you don't have such friends. Okay, well, I don't know why I felt from your face you have friends like that. So, IV drug abusers, right? IV drug abusers is a very important group which can develop infective endocarditis because <coughs> the people who inject intravenously, you can say drugs for addiction purpose, they are really not going to the doctors to get the injections. And usually they are sharing the needles and they are not having sterilized system. So, they tend to push multiple types of microorganism into their circulation, all right? And in these patients, usually infective endocarditis develops on the right side of the heart, on the tricuspid valve. Because veins, if veins are, if, for example, if your friend is uh, IV drug abuser, every day is functioning his veins three times to inject the addict, uh, abused drug, then naturally uh, he may be pushing some bacteria also. So his body is undergoing repeated exposure uh, of the microbe and this if is, uh, what will happen? That right heart will be more predisposed to develop the infective endocarditis in these patients, right, as compared to the left heart. Is that right? Another important thing uh, is that these patients who are IV drug abusers, 
they develop infective endocarditis due to polymicrobial activity. There are multiple microbiological agents are involved in this game. You find multiple organisms because from the skin uh, today they push one organism, tomorrow they are going to push another organism, day after tomorrow they are going to push another organism. You never know there are how many organisms you are going to find in a patient with infective endocarditis which is due to drug abuse, intravenous drug abuse, right. Then the people with the indwelling vascular catheters, the patient who have indwelling vascular catheters in the circulatory system, sometimes tip of, tip of the catheters they get infected and from there they become a very heavy source of persistent bacteremia and of course when bacteremia is there and at the top if heart is predisposed then naturally there is very high risk of infective endocarditis, right. After this we have to discuss one more important thing, right, that why the acute condition is called acute and why the subacute is called subacute. Actually it depends on the tempo of the disease and the clinical features. In case of acute cases, the disease is very, very fulminant. As I told you, in acute cases, heart is healthy. In, in spite of the fact that in acute cases, heart is healthy, but organism is highly virulent. Due to that reason, because organisms are highly virulent in acute cases, disease comes present very dramatically and clinical uh, features develop very, very dangerously and with a rapid tempo and if patient with acute infective endocarditis is not pro properly treated uh, soon, patient will die within days and weeks, right, again. So we can say in clinical presentation, the onset of the disease here is stormy. Here the onset is, onset of disease is, yes, insidious, very slow, insidious. This patient present with stormy onset of the disease and with that high grade fevers, high grade fevers. Of course, in that conditions, the low grade fever, low grade fevers. Then another important thing, here organism is very, very destructive if it is not controlled, not only patient develop high grade fevers, he will develop also destructive lesions on the heart, destructive lesions in the, destructive lesions in heart within few weeks, destructive lesions rapidly developed, rapidly developed in the heart. Here, Usually destructive lesions do not develop that rapidly. There is slow destruction of cardiac tissue. In case of subacute, there is a slow destruction of cardiac tissue, right? And with that, rather there is always an attempt, an attempt for healing and fibrosis, healing and fibrosis. Usually under the vegetation of this, you will find some fibrosis. So this is sudden onset disease, that is gradual onset disease. This is very rapid course of the disease, that is indolent course of the disease. Here is high grade fever, there is low grade fever. Because destructively and rapidly destroy the cardiac structure, so usually patient comes with high grade fever then cardiac complications, cardiac complications. But a patient with subacute infective endocarditis, uh, because disease is progressing very, very, very slowly, so patient is usually diagnosed very late. And during this long time, patient may develop low grade pyrexia of unknown origin and a slow inflammatory process keep on producing cytokines which depresses the bone marrow. And when bone marrow is depressed for a long time, so usually these patients develop anemia of, anemia of chronic diseases. Right? These patients develop anemia of chronic diseases. They develop usually leukopenia. Leukopenia. But when you come to these patients, they usually develop leukocytosis. Because this rapid process irritates the bone marrow to release more neurotrophil. But this very slow process for very long time start depressing the bone marrow. So bone marrow is not making enough RBCs and bone marrow is not making enough white cells. 
is that right? Then another thing which is there that here the clinical presentation will be pointing towards the heart because there are cardiac complications, new murmurs are developing, regurgitating lions may develop, right? Uh, if uh, abscess form, infective endocarditis makes an abscess around the you can say aortic valvular ring that may produce uh, damage to the AV node or bundle of health. So, heart blocks may develop. So, what I say that complications develop here rapidly within the heart due to that reason clinical presentation strongly points that there is something wrong with the heart. But in this patient for long time we do not know that nothing is pointing clinically to the heart and many of these patients come with non-specific features. They come with non-specific features of specific features of systemic infection of systemic infection. As I told you non-specific feature is a type of uh, clinical feature which is not pointing to any particular organ for the disease. For example, in non-specific feature what will happen? That patient will keep on coming to you again and again with sometimes low grade fever, sometimes with fatigue, lassitude. This is all due to cytokines, right? Which are produced due to chronic inflammatory process. Fatigue, lassitude, low grade fever, weight loss, features of bone marrow suppression, but nothing pointing exactly to the heart. Is that right? Cardiac complications are later. But in this case, cardiac complications are earlier. So, disease starts suddenly, in acute case, disease starts suddenly. It starts in a stormy fashion. It is a very rapid temp tempo of the condition. Sudden severe constitutional myalgias, prostration, all these suddenly develop. And with that, if you do not manage the patient and diagnose the patient in time, he will develop cardiac complications, right? And if you fail to manage him in time, within few days or weeks, this person will die. But in this patient, patient is coming with ill defined clinical feature. Maybe patient come, you, f you find there is anemia, there is weight loss, he says he feels all the time fatigue, lassitude, right? All this is not pointing that you have to look at the heart, or is it pointing, right? So, this non specific feature, that is why we say that this is subacute infective endocarditis. Is that now, another group. Uh, which is uh, important as a pathogenic organisms for subacute infective endocarditis is remembered by the mnemonic of H A C E K HAC. Now here, H stands for hemophilus. It stands for hemophilus group of organisms. It's a gram-negative organism, and A stands for Actinobacillus. A e stands for actino, actinobacillus, right? And then the C stands for cardiobacterium. C stands for cardiobacterium. And E stands for Ikinella, Ikinella, and of course K is for Kinginella, not for King, Kinginella. Now these are gram-negative organisms, which are present in our oral cavity as commensals. They are present in our oral cavity as commensals and from our oral cavity or due to resp upper respiratory tract infection, they can enter into blood stream and through that they can reach to the predisposed heart and of course, if there is some predisposition in the heart, there is abnormal blood flow, right, then these bacteria with low virulence can settle over there and can produce infective endocarditis. Now, after discussing this, let us come to one more thing that is the difference of vegetations between the acute infective endocarditis and subacute infective endocarditis, right? The, what is the difference of vegetation? Now, vegetations are the morphological lens of infective endocarditis. How the vegetation form? Let us discuss here. Let us suppose this is a predisposed mitral valve right 
and here is the aortic valve. Let's suppose that this blue is just endo. Yes. Endocardium. Now, suppose this valve is this patient is suffering with rheumatic heart disease and the valve is fibrotic, its cusps are fused and its contours are distorted, right? Uh, in short, its endothelium is injured. So, if this is the injured endothelium, as I told you, that platelet will stick over it and then fibrin will stick over that. In this area, what will happen? That microbes will come and bind over here, right? This type of situation will occur in case of subacute infective endocarditis when there is predisposition and there is thrombi form and then those thrombi get colonized by low virulence organism. This picture should be drawn under the subacute infective endocarditis. But in case of acute infective endocarditis, situation is different. As I told you, in acute endo infective endocarditis, organism is highly virulent. And because organism is highly virulent, this is right, this organism is stick even to the healthy valvular structure and multiply there. When this organism, let's suppose it is Staphylococcus aureus, it is multiplying uh, within the endocardium, it will heavily damage the endocardium. And when it will damage the endocardium, inflammatory reaction will occur. And when inflammatory reaction happens, that lot of white blood cells will enter into the area of bacterial accumulation. Again, first bacteria came and bind with the healthy endocardium. Bacteria colonize and invade the endocardium. Then they multiply within the healthy endocardium. They damage the healthy endocardium. Now, on injured endocardium, where which was initially healthy and bacteria bind, now bacteria have injured it and injured endocardium will be having, what is attaching out to it? Platelets and fibrin. Is that right? Platelets and fibrin are binding there. Secondly, platelets are there, fibrin is there, my, microbes are there and because it's living vascular tissue, so naturally inflammatory reaction will occur and then white blood cells will also enter into this area, right? As microbes will multiply further, they will damage further. So with the time, it will make multiple micro colonies of the microbe. And as time will pass, pass by, what will happen to this vegetation? There are more platelets, there are more platelets, there is more fibrin, but there is a lot more microbes, these are microbes, these are highly virulent organisms and plus a lot more inflammatory cells. And these inflammatory cells are neutrophils plus monocytes and very few lymphocytes. Is that right? Neutrophils are highly destructive cells, right? Neutrophils and macrophages are cells of the acute inflammation. Because of the severe injury, so neutrophil will come here and macrophage will come here. Now the fight is going on between the bacteria and neutrophil and macrophages. And during this fight, neutrophils are also releasing destructive products. Macrophages are also releasing destructive products as well as microbes are also releasing destructive products. So a lot of proteolytic substances and digestive uh, enzymes are produced by the bacteria as, as well as our fighting white blood cells. That will lead to very rapidly and aggressive, you can say destructive vegetation because this vegetation is loaded with a lot of rapidly proliferating dangerous bacteria and due to injury by the bacteria and uh, you can say chemical substances or chemical mediators of inflammation, a lot of white blood cells, especially neutrophil and macrophage come. So we can say that this valve is having a vegetation which is very rapidly developing because bacteria are enhancing their injury, rapidly developing vegetation with lot of microbe with lot of white cell, lot of destructive process. So even though it's a rapidly developing vegetation due to so much destructive product produced by the microbes and by the white blood cells, this will become very loose at multiple places. So it will become large but friable vegetation. And a pieces from here can embolize. Pieces of vegetation can embolize and can produce uh, 
embolism on the systemic circulation. Let me repeat it again. What was there? Initially heart was healthy, but by chance very very virulent organism got settled on the endocardium. Organism entered into endocardium and within endocardium organism started multiplying. When organism was multiplying endocardial injury started severely. Now endocardium which was anticoagulant now convert into procoagulant right uh, and platelet starts sticking and uh, fibrin starts sticking. Now bacteria are inside platelet are sticking on that fibrin is sticking on that. In this way now bacteria are well protected from the uh, you can say antibodies and other uh, complement factors and other serum product uh, which could eliminate the bacteria. Now bacteria keep on invading the valvular tissue and endocardium and elicit very very strong acute inflammatory reaction. Due to that reason local blood vessels dilate, increase permeability there, edema formation there, swelling of the local tissue is there due to inflammation and of course lot of neutrophils and macrophage come. In the end what will happen? That at the site of bacterial invasion we will find a very big vegetation. What is vegetation? Vegetation is the morphological typical pathological lien of the infective endocarditis. This particular vegetation which is formed in acute infective endocarditis is large, it is rapidly developing, right? It has lot of platelets and fibrin, it has lot of very destructive microbes, it has lot of acutely active neutrophil and macrophages and because this uh, vegetation has developed in a very short time and due to uh, due to the fact it is loaded with destructive enzymes it tend to break from here and there and when pieces of uh, you can say vegetation break down they embolize to the general circulation right wherever these pieces of uh, you can septic emboli because they are having the bacteria with that septic emboli go if they stuck to stick to the cerebral circulation they will produce infarction in the brain and then bacteria will go into that infarcted area and that will become abscess. They may produce abscess in the brain, they may produce abscess in the spleen, the, uh, this uh, embolism, septic embolism may produce abscesses in the kidneys, it may produce abscess even the myocardium because through the coronary artery it may come to the myocardium, right? So what happens that patients start developing metastatic abscesses even, right? Not only this, this highly destructive vegetation even may ulcerate and even perforate the valve. This is very important point. The ulcerative lesions, the ulcerative lesions, and the perforative lesions. Why? Because it is highly destructive, and that may lead to acute valvular failure. Acute, uh, you can say. Suppose if it is mitral valve, acute mitral valve regurgitation. The one one more complication. Then if this vegetation is moving towards the aorta, or if vegetation is really on the aortic valve. Right, it may start destroying and go into deeper tissue and even it may affect the conduction pathway, right? And it may destroy the AV nodal tissue or inflame the AV nodal tissue or bundle of hairs and that may produce conduction defects in the heart and PR interval may be prolonged, right? So these are now cardiac complications starting. As I told you, valve may perforate and sudden, suddenly patient will clinically deteriorate or patient may develop uh, abnormal conduction defects. Then okay that let's suppose this is the valve ring. Let's suppose this is the valve ring, this is mitral valve leaflet and above there is atrium and below there is ventricle. So, and this is aortic ring, right, aortic valve which is tricuspid valve. Now, if the vegetation start here and from here it come to the valve ring, now vegetation may move around the valve ring because fibrous tissue of the valvular annulus is resistant. So pus will move around the valve ring and this is called ring abscess. What is it called? Ring abscess. This ring abscess can produce multiple problems. As I told you on this side it can fail the conduction pathway and this ring abscess if it forms around the prosthetic valve, prosthetic valve will dislodge from its uh, anatomical position or this ring abscess may lead to invasion of organism into myocardium and it may lead to myocardial abscess and even sometimes this ring abscess becomes so you can say aggressive that this is pericardial sac a ring abscess from here organism jump to the pericardium and that may produce suppurative pericarditis. Now what is this all happening? These are cardiac complications 
right? What are the cardiac complications in uh, acute infective endocarditis? Again, first we have to remember that cardiac complications are more common in acute infective endocarditis than subacute in infective endocarditis. Why? Because in, in acute infective endocarditis, organism is highly virulent. So, it elicits acute, strong acute inflammatory response and organism is producing destructive enzyme at the top. Uh, neutrophils are also producing destructive enzymes. So, naturally as vegetation grow up, right, it is rapidly growing vegetation which is very, very friable, which break down very easily. It produces septic emboli in the body and metastatic abscesses in multiple area, not only outside the heart, but this produces severe destructive problems in the heart. It produces ulcerative lesions on the valve. It produces, you can say, it can produce perforation of valve which may lead to sudden ventricular failure right, very severe clinical deterioration in the patient or it may produce ring abscess, it may produce conduction problem, it may produce myocardial abscesses, it may produce even pericardial suppurative inflammation. But when we compare uh, the vegetation and disease process of acute with the subacute condition, story is different. In subacute condition what really happens that let's suppose here is the valve and here is ventricle right now in this case well I, I told you that maybe valve is already distorted valve is already abnormal and distorted this is the first problem is that right now this is a pre predisposed area and bacteria will come with high virulence or low virulence low virulence bacteria come now these bacteria which come with low virulence they are, they are growing very very slowly Right? So slowly they form around themselves platelet cap and fibrin. They will make platelet cap and fibrin. Now one thing you have to compare here. This is vegetation of acute. That is vegetation of subacute. This vegetation of acute, this vegetation of acute has highly virulent organism, highly destructive organism that is having slowly proliferating organism, slowly destructive organism, less virulent organism. Here this is rapidly growing, that here is slowly growing. This one is having acute inflammatory response and in the vegetation there are a lot of neutrophil and macrophages that is eliciting chronic inflammatory response due to that reason usually vegetation has less neutrophil and it has more macrophages with lymphocytes which are uh, pointing towards chronic inflammation, right. Then another thing. In this case, there is no fibrosis, rather under the valve, there are ulcerative and destructive lesions. Here under the valve, because there is chronic inflammation and in chronic inflammation, chemical mediator lead to he attempts on healing. So there will be fibrosis. Because there is fibrosis within this uh, fibrotic band, within this vegetation or under this vegetation, this is held here relatively more tightly. Here it was held loosely. So more chances of perforations less chances of perforation, more chances of metastatic abscesses, less chances of metastatic abscesses, more chances of ring abscesses, less chances of ring abscesses, more chances of you can say suppurative pericarditis, less chances of suppurative pericarditis, is that right? But something very important that as I told you that this condition is usually for short duration. Why this is acute infective endocarditis is short duration because disease present in a very stormy and very fulminant way and uh, pointing towards the cardiac situation. Either patient will go to the hospital and if patient is properly treated, bacteria will be eradicated, right? Or patient will die. Is that right? So it, it does not become a long term disease. But that disease, as I told you, that disease uh, develops the clinical features which are not pointing towards heart. So non-specific features are there. Sometimes some doctors suspect there is some infection in the body, he give antibiotic and partially treat that. You are getting it? So this disease keep on running sometimes weeks and months without proper management, right? Due to that reason, this patient develop chronic antigenemia. Chronic antigenemia means that bacteria keep on releasing the antigens. These are bacterial antigens which are chronically released into circulation. And of course, because patient has developed antibodies also, so antigen antibodies react and antigen antibody 
complexes are formed in the circulation. So we call that in these patients who have subacute infective endocarditis, there are more chances to make the immune complexes in circulation. But this patient usually may not live long enough for that type of complications. Let me repeat it again. Antigens may be released from acute vegetation, but antigen can also be released from chronic, right? In acute case, these are the septic or emboli which are breaking. But in that case, this is chronic antigenemia which is more often. And after that, because body has made some antibodies, so antigen-antibody complexes are formed in the body. Or we say immune complexes are formed in the body. So a very characteristic um, uh, clinical features develop in this particular condition more often and less often with the acute due to immune complexes. What these circulating immune complexes are doing? These circulating immune complexes may go to multiple area and get deposited into microcirculation. For example, if this immune complexes go and stick with a very small blood vessel, suppose this is the antigen, right? And on the antigen, antibody is sticking. Where antigen antibody deposit into circulation, usually they deposit into microcirculation. They will activate the complements and complement will damage the local tissue. That will produce vasculitic lions inflammation of the small vessel, vasculitic lion. Let me repeat it. Antigens are being shed by the vegetation for long time in circulation. Antibodies are also following that. Antigen antibody form immune complexes. These immune complexes get deposited into multiple part of the circulation. Wherever immune complexes get deposited, they will activate the complements and complements will damage the local tissue. Plus, complement factor will attract the neutrophil and neutrophil will be also activated at the local area and damage the local tissue. This type of immune reaction is called type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. Type 3 hypersensitivity reaction or type 3 hypersensitivity disease uh, mo uh, develops more often in uh, subacute condition and it develops less often with acute condition. Now, in this condition, what will be the clinical features? Number one. For example, if these immune complexes reach to the ends of the fingers, under the nails, capillary take a acute turn. So some immune complexes get stuck into capillaries under the nails. We call them some sub ungual capillaries, capillaries under the nails. So many of these immune complexes get stuck under the uh, nails in the capillaries and those capillaries develop vasculitic lesions and then these capillaries break, uh, you can say, uh, are destroyed. So that may produce hemorrhagic lesions. And because these hemorrhagic lesions are uh, elongated hemorrhagic lesions, flame shaped uh, linear hemorrhagic lesions in the nails, we call them splinter hemorrhages. Clinically we call them, have you heard of them? Splinter hemorrhages. So splinter hemorrhages are long, linear, elongated, flame shaped hemorrhages in the, under the nail bed. Right? These splinter hemorrhages are a very important clinical feature related with infective endocarditis. But do you know what is the most common cause of splinter hemorrhages? Not infective endocarditis. Most common cause of splinter hemorrhages are splinters themselves. When uh, people, keep, people who work uh, hardly through their manually, they get trouble in splinter hemorrhages in their nails. So just having splinter hemorrhages does not mean you have infective endocarditis, but it is one of the features of infective endocarditis. Carditis. Then another thing that when these, okay, one feature we talked about was splinter hemorrhages. Number two, what really happens that anti these antigen antibody complexes get stuck under the capillaries, we take acute turn under the tip of the capillary, capillaries turn back. If these immune complexes get deposited there and activate the complement, activate the neutrophil, some inflammatory lesions are formed there. And these patients develop inflammatory painful lesions in the fingertips and these are called ossular nodes. These are called ossular nodes. Have you heard of, heard of them or not? You never heard of them. Anyway, now you hear. So th uh, there can be splinter hemorrhages, there can be ossular nodes. Then sometimes uh, some destructive lesions are formed in the palms, palmar aspect or plantar aspect of the foot, right? And here patient may develop multiple hemorrhagic lesions. Is that right? And these hemorrhagic lesions are called Janeway's lesions. What are they called? Janeway's, Janeway's lesions. These are called Janeway's lesions. So what patient is developing the problems? 
he is developing immune complex mediated problem than vasculitic problem right and this may clinically come as splinter hemorrhages under the nails it may come as ocular nodes in the finger pulp they may be appearing as red spots non tender red spots on the palm as Janeway's lesions but similar lesions may form on the plantar aspect of the foot also then such lesions may form under the skin also because if these the same antigen antibody complexes get deposited into uh, microcirculation of the skin you may develop petechial hemorrhages small hemorrhages and we call them petechial petechial hemorrhages then another problem that similar hemorrhages may form in retina right if you do ophthalmoscopy in the retina you may find circular or boat shaped hemorrhagic lesions with pale yellow centers and these are called roth spots these are called roth spots so these are all lesions due to vasculitic event and immune complex mediated problems is that right now another problem which occurs and that is the most important if you forget all of them that is sometimes lot of antigen antibody complexes get deposited into glomeruli when they damage the, they get deposited into glomeruli the severe inflammatory uh, changes in the glomeruli and patient may develop glomerulo nephritis patient may develop diffuse glomerulo nephritis because in both kidneys almost all glomeruli are inflamed so you call it diffuse glomerular nephritis and if glomeruli are so much inflamed and glomerular capillaries start rupturing patient may start glomerular basement membrane is injured patient may develop protein urea and with that patient may develop hematuria is that right so glomerular uh, glomerular nephritis clinically may present with hematuria and protein urea in some severe cases it may lead to renal failure even is that right but that is seen more commonly in acute infective endocarditis than in subacute infective endocarditis is that right then we can talk about let's talk from top to down if i'm a patient with infective endocarditis what type of clinical features i can develop number one i will have the fever especially in acute fever will be very high grade in subacute case fever will be low grade then I will develop weight loss if disease is longer. In subacute case, I will develop significant weight loss. Then I may complain of the fatigue. I may complain of lassitude, right? And with these things, then there is a saying: the fever with the changing murmur. There is a clinical saying by big professors that fever with the changing murmur is infective endocarditis until proved otherwise. Tell me one single investigation you will do immediately if a patient come come with fever fever patient come with fever and with a changing murmur and one more sign i give you splenomegaly you have to think patient is having infective endocarditis until proved otherwise is that right and of course the two investigation which should immediately rush for one is blood cultures and second is echocardiography echocardiography can show you the vegetation and when we talk about the echocardiography you have to remember that trans thoracic effect uh, echocardiography trans thoracic echocardiography pick up only 60 to 65 percent of the patient every third patient with vegetation is missed by the trans thoracic echocardiography so if you really want to diagnose the patient uh, look for esophageal trans esophageal echocardiography uh, the echocardiographic probe is passed into esophagus and just behind the heart the, within the esophagus they put the echo probe and that can scan where is the vegetation and the sensitivity of that test is 95 percent right so let's review what i was saying that any patient who comes with fever and changing murmur it is infective endocarditis until proven otherwise and if someone has fever with changing murmur with splenomegaly and hematuria oh it's a, almost 99 percent chances he is having infective endocarditis but really you want to confirm you have to do the blood cultures and blood cultures should be taken preferably when fever is at the peak and blood culture should be taken from three different sites and at least three sets should be taken for example fever is going you take one sample one set of samples now you take it 
another group of sample after a few hours, then again you take after a few hours and you hope to get catch the organism somewhere. You get it or not? And of course you have to do echocardiography, but as compared to transthoracic echocardiography, if possible you should prefer which one? Transesophageal. That, that is sensitivity 95% and transthoracic sensitivity is only 65%. Is that right? Now, let's come back. We're talking about the clinical feature. The patient has fever and patient is having, you can say, weight loss, especially in subacute case, right? Patient is having anemia in subacute case, pallor. And in acute case, patient has anxious look. Patient is uh, having very severe weakness in acute case, right? Prostration, we call it. Then another thing. That Leon's clinical presentation, which is pointing towards heart, will be more commonly present in acute and general or, and constitutional features or ill-defined and non-specific feature will be more present in subacute. Is that right? Then another thing that you may find the features related with vascular event, embolic phenomenon, and, and immune complex problem. These clinical features may be metastatic abscesses in different organs. They may be rot spot here, particular hemorrhages on the skin, splinter hemorrhages in the nails, ocular nodes in the fingertips, Janeway's lien on the plumber, plumber surfaces and hematurias. And with that, many times these immune complexes get stuck in plural membrane or pericardial membranes. So sometimes it may produce pericardial rub or it may produce pleuritic rub or pleuritic pain. And in some of these patients, when there's chronic antigenemia, immune complexes may get deposited into plural, uh, into uh, synovial membranes present within the synovial joints. So some of these patients may even develop polyarthritis, which is the feature of chronic immune complex disease. Am I clear? Right? So these were different clinical features. So can you clinically differentiate these patients? Or is it difficult now? Anyone coming with severe disease, severe features, rapidly developing complications, and rapid course of the disease is acute? Is that right? Someone coming with milder clinical features, non-cardiac clinical presentation, and usually slow onset of the disease and gradual tempo of the disease, you must think of subacute infective endocarditis, right? After this, we have to talk about, now systemic emboli more commonly found in the central nervous system, in the myocardium, and in the kidney. Now, now we are going to talk about Duke's criteria Duke's criteria for diagnosis of diagnosis of infective endocarditis. Now it has some major criteria and some minor criteria. Minor criteria. Now in the major criteria, number one, that there should be a positive blood culture. There should be, there should be positive blood culture. And for regarding the blood culture as a positive blood culture, this criteria number one, that regarding the blood culture as a positive blood culture as a diagnosis of criteria for a diagnosis of infective endocarditis out of these two things one should be there right number one that there is typical organism in two separate cultures there is typical organism like streptococcus viridans or streptococcus aureus typical organism in two cultures or if you find on the culture the organism is not the typical for the infective endocarditis that at least there should be persistently positive blood cultures there should be persistently persistently positive blood cultures what I really mean three or more than three three or more than three cultures should be positive and they should be 12 hours apart, right? It means that there is persistent 
uh, organisms presence in the blood right then there can be second criteria and second major criteria is endocardium involvement the evidence of endocardium involvement evidence of endo first was positive blood culture second criteria is endocardium involvement now the criteria for endocardium involvement the evidence may be uh, positive echogram or new valvular regurgitation there may be positive echo findings echocardiographic findings or there may be new valvular regurgitation now what is the positive echocardiographic finding the positive echocardiographic finding is that you must be able to see vegetations on echo or there must be abscesses intracardiac abscesses in the echo or you may find that valve this dehiscence of the valve the artificial valve is not properly placed at its normal position is that right full diagnosis the minor criteria which are there is number one is that person has a heart which is predisposed or person is IV drug abuser. I mean there is some predisposition for infective endocarditis, predisposition for infective endocarditis. There may be cardiac abnormality, person may be IV drug abuser, right? This is one minor criteria second minor criteria is fever more than 38 centigrade fever more than 38 centigrade third criteria is the vascular or immunological signs i've already discussed that vascular or immunological signs vascular or immunological signs for example roth spot or there may be particular hemorrhages or there may be linear hemorrhages they are called splinter hemorrhages or ocular nodes or chain resilience or evidence of uh, you can say glomerulonephritis right polyarthritis vascular or immunological signs right if they are present they are considered one of the minor feature or echo findings or echo findings echocardiographic findings which are not qualifying for the major criteria or blood culture blood culture is positive but not qualifying as the major criteria so it means either there are two major criteria and there are five one two three four and five minor criteria we have seen that for uh, Duke's criteria for diagnosis of infective endocarditis there are two major criteria and the five minor criteria to make a definitive diagnosis of infective endocarditis, we should have at least two major criteria. And if we do not have two major criteria, then we should have at least one major and plus three minor criteria. And if we don't have any major criteria, then at least we should have all the minor, all five minor criteria. That makes a diagnosis of infective endocarditis. How we will compare and contrast the different lions of different type of endocarditis already we discussed in the beginning of the lecture that some people de develop endocarditis as a part of rheumatic heart disease right now let let me go into detail of this here is mitral valve which i've put over there in rheumatic heart disease there's immune mediated damage to the mitral valves and multiple small vegetations are formed along the line of closure. These are small but multiple vegetations. These are sterile vegetations and they consist of just platelets and fibrin. And a very important point, they do not have any microorganism, they are sterile and they don't detach and they don't embolize. But when we compare rheumatic heart disease vegetations with the vegetations of infective endocarditis, which we discussed very recently, that infective endocarditis vegetation are very large. They are not sterile. They are having the microorganism. These are septic vegetation. 
These vegetation have a lot of inflammatory cells as well as microbiological agents and all of them are producing destructive substances. Due to that reason, these vegetations uh, are not only large but they are friable also and they can easily break away and embolize and they can lead eventually to septic metastatic abscesses in the body or septic emboli in the body, right? Then we can talk about marantic endocarditis. Marantic endocarditis is a condition a marantic vegetation is a condition which occurs when a person has hypercoagulable blood. When blood is hypercoagulable. When blood has a tendency to coagulate very easily, then naturally platelet and fibrin masses form at multiple places on the valves, right? This type of situation may be seen in uh, malignancies, malignancies, cancers, especially CA pancreas or CA colon, right? In these malignancies, Mucin is released in the blood. What is released? Mucin. And mucin is procoagulant, right? And blood gets a high tendency to undergo coagulation. And of course, some masses of coagulated blood or its constituents may be deposited over the valves of the heart. Again, these vegetations are initially sterile, but they can become infected and septic during bacteremic phase. Number two, these are very loosely attached with the valve and they can dis dislodge from there and they can produce thromboembolism. Again, let's compare. Rheumatic heart disease has multiple vegetations, sterile vegetations, which do not detach, right? Infective endocarditis vegetation may be small, one or more, but usually they are rapidly growing, they break away, they disintegrate and they're destructive, they are ulcerative, they are septic and they can produce septic embolism or metastatic abscesses. But when we talk about marantic endocarditis, this person has hypercoagulable state, it may be due to malignancy or hypercoagulability may be due to burns. Someone develop extensive burns, blood may become hypercoagulable or uh, patient who have promyelocytic, promyelocytic acute myeloid leukemia right this also this type of uh, leukemia also releases chemical substances which are procoagulant right so any condition which lead to the blood to become more hypercoagulable uh, patient may develop multiple marantic uh, vegetations again they can dislodge right but usually they are sterile but if there's bacteremic phase they may become infected right after that then we can talk about Vegetations of SLE. Vegetations of SLE are also called Libman sac vegetations. Libman sac vegetations. Libman sac disease or SLE vegetations are actually due to immunological process again. These vegetations are formed on the valve where they may form on any side of the valve. They may form on any side of the valve and these vegetations are a lot of fibrin and platelets and they are sticking very tightly with the valve and underlying valve here is abnormal. Underlying valve, if you remove the vegetation, is very much inflamed, intensely inflamed. Remember, here underlying valve is absolutely normal, but here underlying valve is absolutely abnormal and it is tightly sticking. It does not embolize easily and uh, when it heals, it leads to fibrosis and distortion of the valve. Another important point is that sometimes they have hematoxylin bodies within the valve which point towards the diagnosis. Now we come to the carcinite syndrome. You know carcinite syndrome, normally the carcinite tumors are formed within the GIT. If in the GIT there is carcinite tumor, right, if carcinite tumor is producing uh, biologically active products, usually these products are destroyed within the liver, right. For example, carcinate tumor may produce rotanine or carcinate tumor may produce calicrine or bradykinin or histamine or other substances. But usually from through portal circulation when carcinate tumors release their bioactive products and if they go to the liver they are destroyed. But if this primary tumor gives secondaries and these secondaries are formed into liver then what really happens that Again, now, 
what really happens that if secondary develop into liver then from the liver then from the liver bioproducts from these metastases of carcinide will go to the right heart and there serotonin or its breakdown product lead to intense fibrosis and thickening as of thickening of the endocardium of the right heart but when these products go to the lungs they are destroyed over there so what really happens that right heart is more exposed to the bioactive product of carcinate tumors metastasis in the liver or by those carcinate tumors which are not draining into portal circulation right and when these carcinate tumor produces 5 hydroxytryptamine or its metabolites they produce intense fibrotic reaction within the uh, you can say endocardium of the right heart that may lead to dysfunction of tricuspid valve tricuspid valve may become stenotic or regurgitant Some, sometimes they produce dysfunction in the pulmonary valve right and usually if you do histological examination you will find that this particular valve is having lot of mucopolysaccharide material with some extra unwanted extra smooth muscles with some collagen but if someone develop carcinoid lesions in the lungs the naturally bioactive product will go to the left heart now endocardium in the left heart will suffer and carcinoid related endocardial damage will develop and maybe mitral valve become fibrotic right and left heart may suffer with the complications like the right heart is that right so these are different type of endocarditis and their lesions again let me repeat it rheumatic heart disease vegetations don't embolize marantic vegetations may embolize sle usually do not carcinoid never but infective endocarditis embolize very frequently number 1 number 2 rheumatic heart disease is immune mediated sle is immune mediated and marantic is due to hypercoagulable state in the blood and carcinide is due to bioactive product from the carcinate tumors and infective endocarditis is due to microbiological agents out of these brantic vegetation the primarily sterile but they can become infected during bacteremic phase and infective endocarditis vegetation are always septic right and usually the rheumatic heart disease vegetations or sle vegetations and carcinide lesions they don't get septic easily is that right so th these were few words that you want to compare contrast different type of endocarditis